list by the Constraints Bay Area Committee of this council session. Um, and we have a number of guests with us today, which I'll introduce later. There's a bit of a delay on my um, system, so um, I'm having a similar problem to Liz's, but mine is more to do with the hands, etc. So but we'll move straight into the agenda. Um, there are no apologies for absence members since we're all here today. Um, and item two on our agenda is declarations of interest. Um, I, I'll start off. I have a connection to item 12 on today's agenda as advisor to the Board of Granton Museum. But having applied the objective test, I do not consider my connection to be an interest and I intend to remain in the meeting for this item. Are there any other declarations members? OK, members, thank you. Um, Members, there is a typo on item six, page 15, which should, of course, read Bainock and Strath Bay and not Loch Arbor. Although maybe um, we get Loch Arbor funding this year rather than Bainock and Strath Bay funding. Maybe we should ask Richard about that later on in the meeting. And now, um, item three on the agenda, members, I'm delighted to introduce um, Linda Coe. Um, Linda, obviously, as you all know, is not only chairman of um, Grant and Spain and Vicente Community Council, but is also the leading light of the Strathspey Steam Railway so, uh, and the Rails to Granton project. So um, I'll hand you over to Linda and Linda, take your time. It's all up to you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, it's a verbal update, so hopefully um, it'll all make sense. Um, I thought I'd give a bit of background to what we're doing. So. What we're what we're what the Strath Bay Steam Railway is doing is seeking a tours order to construct and operate the railway from Broom Hill to Granton on Spey. An authorization to construct and operate a railway is granted by Scottish ministers under the Transport and Work Scotland Act 2007. And this is, is a much more complex process than the light railway order which we have got sought previously. Um, not only are we the uh, first heritage railway to apply for a tours order, but we are in fact only the second application that Scottish ministers have had, the first being the refurbishment of Queen Street Station in Glasgow. Uh, our application is made more complicated by being the first road and rail application. So we're applying in conjunction with Transport Scotland at Transport Scotland's request with, in the hope that that will help them with their budget from the Scottish Government to actually undertake the road realignment works. So the process so far has been that we made a pre-application in 2019, which went to consultation. And that consultation was a few statutory consultees such as SEPA and the National Park and included Highland Council as well. We then started to discuss the responses to that consultation at the end of 2019 and unfortunately at the beginning of the pandemic. So then that became quite challenging trying to deal with those. But the main requirement from that consultation was that we updated our environmental surveys. Um, again, challenging during a, a pandemic, but we completed those in early 2021. So now we're in the process of getting ready for the full application. Now that full application requires about some 14 key documents comprising over 1,500 pages and includes uh, a draft tours order, a comprehensive environmental statement covering all the, the route of the railway and the station area, and engineer, engineering drawings and plans. In addition to that, we have to demonstrate that we've secured all the necessary land to construct the railway and the station terminus. And we either do that by showing that we are purchasing or leasing the land, or we require compulsory purchase powers. Transport Scotland is seeking compulsory purchase powers for the, the areas of 
land that it needs for its road realignment. Um, but we in the railway are purchasing and leasing and are in the process of finalising suspensive missives for two leases and one purchase. By and large, the railway part of the application is complete. Unfortunately, Transport Scotland is nowhere near ready. Um, as rather late in the day, they identified that the end keep that had been built to the Cairn distillery fundamentally affected the A95 realignment and underbridge plans, which have been submitted with the pre-application consultation. So despite various discussions with Transport Scotland and the TORS unit at the Scottish Government, we've got no choice but to wait for Transport Scotland to redo their plans and surveys before we can submit the application. Um, this potentially exposes us to the requirement to redo the environmental surveys again. And as these are seasonal, um, for example, protected species such as hibernating bats have to be done obviously during the winter time that they're hibernating. This obviously equals potentially much more delay. And that really is where we are. I'm obviously happy to ask questions if I've not explained enough of the background because I've, I appreciate that I've been immersed in this for four years. Um, so. Linda, Linda, thank you very much for that. Um, it's, I think you'll probably appreciate that uh, members from Bendik and Strathspey have always supported this project and will hopefully continue to do so. As has Highland Council, because the, the members from Bendik and Strathspey previously uh, took a motion to Highland Council to, to gather the, the council's support. And whilst probably were unable to support you in major ways financially, certainly anything that we can do uh, to help you progress this project in the future, then, then we will do. And if, uh, if, you're, if it's of any assistance to you, then we're quite happy to write to the Transport Minister or, or anything, and maybe we can discuss that offline after the meeting. Councillor Coburn. Thank you, Linda. That was uh, really comprehensive, and I think it also highlights the amount of work um, and, and the it's like wading through treacle as well, these processes. Um, and and uh, thank you so much for sticking to it and, and being as um, eloquent in, in the description. We, Councillor Robin has said that we do support this, and that's absolutely correct. Um, I th wonder, um, as a, an organisation, should we be writing to the, the Transport Minister because the Scottish Rail franchise has been taken over by the Scottish Government, and that may um, open a different dialogue or, or, or whatever, and just wondered if, if you thought that may be of any merit. Thank um, you. Well, well no. through the through MSPs, and we've been it, we wrote on several occasions to the Transport Minister, trying to get them to uh, get him to get Transport Scotland to raise the item further up their agenda, because we felt that during the pandemic they were dealing with other things rather than the steam railway. Um, so. We've had all sorts of assurances from the Transport Minister that Transport Scotland are working as best they can with the resources that they have. I'm not sure, having had the meetings that we've had with Transport Scotland and also with the TORS unit, that there's much more that can be done apart from just sit and wait for Transport Scotland to go through the, go through the processes that they have to go through. But thank you for the offer. Councillor Bruce. Thank you. So, thank you very much for your explanation. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the leases, how many leases have you, or different leases have you got for different properties in this? It's two leases. So we're talking about Muckrack Estate and Seafield Estates. Um, and then Glen Begg is um, selling us the land. So right. two leases and a purchase. 
and are they, are they sort of good? Well, I, I don't need to ask you, but there'll be good watertight leases because we don't want leases to go awry when we've got everything else up and running. Um, as far as I know, you know, with my best judgment and with the legal advice that we've got, they're 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 as good as they can be. Thanks, Linda. I'm sure of that. OK, thank you. Councillor Hadley. Hi, Linda. Excuse me. <clears throat> I just wanted to say, um, well, until the very last bit, I just wanted to say that is an absolute a miracle feat, everything that's been accomplished. And it's inspirational to other groups to see if they could achieve anything near as the same as you have. And I just then wanted to say with the news that there's been the delay that I'm really upset to hear that. And as my colleagues have said, if there's anything we can do to aid, whether it's right as a council to say that we're fully in support and would like it expedient, I can't even say the word expedient. No, nope, I'm not going to try, rushed. Um, <laughs> then um, we'd be very pleased to do so because I really am in awe of what's been achieved by yourself and your group. Thank you. Yeah, Linda, I think there's no doubt about it how much we all appreciate the fact that the huge amount of work that's been done, but also that the people outside of Bainnick and Strathspey need to appreciate the economic impact that the Strathspey Railway, um, going from Aviemore all the way to Granton, will bring. Yeah. Um, and that needs to be a major thing that the Scottish ministers have to consider. Um, this is not um, um, a toy railway. This is a major economic project for the whole of Bainnick and Strathspey. And you have to be complimented for getting it this far. Thank you. Um, we're certainly characterising it as a regeneration project for Grantown in particular, but for Badenoch and Strathspey as well. I think maybe in that case there is there's some potential funding that um, we, we could put in, in in years to come, although not to the massive amounts like getting us across the, the, the A95. So um, um, we, we'll do what we can do. But thank, but, th but thank you for your presentation. It's, it's really interesting and it's important that we keep this project at the front of everybody's mind. So yeah, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the day, Linda, or you're more than happy to well, leave. Well, I'd love to stay, but you know, I've got to wash my hair, you know, so. It's not not a problem I normally have. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Thank well, you. thank you. That's very good of you. Cheers. Bye. Bye bye. Members, we, we move now to item four, which is the Scottish Fire and Rescue Area Committee Performance Report. Um, and I believe we have Bruce Milne and Roddy Chapman. Um, I, I don't know who's going to, to lead on this. Bruce, probably you. Hi, good, good morning. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to the group. Um, Roddy's not here today. He, he's off today. Um, just it's the first time I've attended the, the, the group, so it's a nice opportunity to meet you all, councillors. Um, I am the group commander now for Highland Central. I um, have taken over um, from Ross, who's moved on to Pastures New Year's away at the training function. Um, so very much getting up to speed uh, within the area or the areas that I cover, uh, one being yourself, which is Baidenock and Strath Bay. Um, you've all had sight of the report, I believe it was circulated uh, for yourself, the performance report uh, for quarter three, which is covering October to December. Um, I won't go through it in its entirety, but I will just, you know, briefly talk about some of the KPIs. Um, you know, there are six KPIs, as you'll be aware, uh, you know, which we're delivering against within your area uh, and for the whole of Highland, which are to reduce accidental dwellings, um, reduce accidental dwelling fire casualties, reduce accidental dwelling fire fatalities, reduce deliberate fires, reduce um, special services, and in particular road traffic collisions, and reduce unwanted fire alarm signals. So I'll go through them briefly, sort of one at a time. In terms of the accidental dwelling fire figures, <clears throat> as you'll see, um, the figures still remain fairly static and fairly low across, you know, across the area. There was a slight spike within this quarter uh, in December. And when I say spike, because it's quite low numbers, um, it doesn't take much to, you know, to push it into, um, into the red. Um, literally, you know, two dwelling fires, both of which were fairly minor, um, which were in, in Canusi. Um, one of them I have referred um, just to see if we can do any further home fire safety visits uh, and supports to, um, but other than that, there was a slight spike in in December, and those are both, as I say, in the Canusi area. Um, 
you know, moving down, um, you know, towards, and this links into the, the accidental dwell of fire casualties and fatalities. They're both sitting at zero, which is very, very encouraging to see, and long may it continue. Um, what, what we do and what our main strategy is to, to keep this at bay and, and keep the, the numbers low is to carry out, if we have, a, you know, a, a dwelling fire, fire, we will carry out what's called a post-domestic incident response. And that effectively is where a fire crew will go out, they'll knock on the door, they'll offer immediate support and guidance uh, to try and help prevent any reoccurrence. Um, now, in the past, you know, pre-COVID, we would offer and open that up to the surrounding properties as well. But because of the restrictions on some of our working practices during the, the you know, the, the COVID restrictions, we've limited that to the property directly involved. Um, I'm pleased to say that now we're about emerging from and, and some of the COVID restrictions seem to be easing. We're in a position to open that up where we will now, um, you know, go back to how things was a bit of business as usual in terms of um, doing these post incident domestic responses to surround the properties as well. That gives both comfort um, to the neighbourhoods and communities, but also gives us an opportunity as a service to try and get into properties and, and pass that safety, that wider safety message to, to our communities. Um, we continue to deliver home fire safety visits. As we say, that is probably our um, uh, most valuable tool in trying to reduce accidental dwelling fires and the casualties and fatalities that can occur from that. Um, and again, we continue to deliver them within the area. They're done by whole time operational crews. They're done by, re well, sorry, newer area will be the retained um, uh, operational crews. And they're supported by our community action team. We have a dedicated community action team. And also we have people called rural full-time post holders, which support the retained um, uh, fire stations within the area. So um, that, that's what we're kind of doing to, to keep those numbers low. I'm pleased to see they're low uh, and, and long may that continue. If anybody's got any questions, please feel free to, to stop me during this, uh, and I'm quite happy to to, to, to answer any questions. I'll um, take questions at the end, Bruce, once you're finished. Okay, that's fine. No worries at all. That's great. Okay, um, moving down towards sort of the deliberate fires. Again, I'm pleased to say that for the area, um, and I'm new to the area, I'm, you know, uh, I stay elsewhere, but... Um, they, they do appear to be very low in this particular quarter. Um, we have no deliberate fires. There was a spike, as to be expected, in June and July this year. Uh, we saw, and, and again, when I say spike, it's low numbers. It was three and four. Uh, and that's possibly been down, uh, you know, in this, last summer, we, we saw a bit of a, an easing of some restrictions and more people were out and about in the area. And these things can, um, you know, can happen. We try and work with our, you know, um, countryside rangers with schools etc to try before easter and before summer to try and get some kind of willful fire raising message out there to talk about consequences and damage and environmental impact uh, but last year that was really challenging due to covid the schools just you know we, 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 we struggled to get into some of some of the schools and educational establishments uh, and again looking forward this year i I'm, I'm hopeful that that will ease and it's my intention um, you know, for the areas that I manage to, to, to set a little bit of direction in terms of youth engagement and continue that, that sort of support that we provide with, you know, the sort of countryside rangers uh, working with Safer Highland uh, antisocial behaviour groups, etc. Uh, moving forward and that will continue. I'll talk a little bit about road traffic collisions. Uh, when I look at the trend, um, you know, looking at the statistics, I'm pleased to say, again, for the area, they, they seem to be fairly low. You know, when you look at the fiscal years, looking back over the last four years or so, we're seeing a, an increased, uh, sorry, a decrease in the number of RTCs. Some of that may have been down to um, the restrictions around COVID and, the, you know, um, uh, a reduction in road travel. I think we saw that across all the areas in Scotland. Um, and I'm conscious of the fact that as we come out of COVID, um, we will see more traffic on the roads, we'll see more tourism and more people coming into the area. So we'll, 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 we'll monitor that. Uh, we will continue to work with our partners in Police Scotland and the Council to try and help deliver road safety initiatives and advice where appropriate. And we'll continue to make sure that we're, you know, our operational staff are trained and capable to respond should the worst happen. So that is what we will do in relation to road traffic collisions. But I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see on, on the statistics there that it seems to be quite low in your area and continuing to drop. Lastly, in terms of the actual performance, unwanted fire alarm signals, um, again, 
we're seeing quite a marked reduction um, in what we call UFAS, the unmounted fire alarm signals. And, and again, um, I kind of applaud the work of the crews um, for the first line of advice they give to premises that, that do have an unmounted fire alarm signal, as well as our fire safety enforcement officers who work with um, the premises to make sure that we can reduce that. Although it's low numbers, I did go in prior to this meeting and have a little look at the actual um, the, the premises type that seem to have the most. And it's the same as, as we see in other areas. Your area is no different. It usually is um, care homes, uh, nursing establishment or, or sort of residential care homes, as well as distilleries and warehousing associated with distilleries. So uh, we'll continue to work with those with, with those um, sectors uh, through our fire safety enforcement and through our operational crews. But again, I'm pleased to say the numbers are, are really reducing and that's good because it frees up other other time for crews to, to you know, to focus on home fire safety visits, uh, capturing operational intelligence and training to make sure that they're capable for, for when that time comes. Um, and lastly, on the report, you'll see a little bit about station availability within your areas. Um, you'll notice there's a, you know, sort of slight pinch points in Abbey Moor. And when you look at Granton, um, the second appliance at Granton was at 31%. I know, having looked at the, because I, I, I took up post in, in January, having looked at January's availability, I know that there's been a marked improvement in the second appliance at Granton. I've spoken to Station Commander Chapman um, in relation to recruitment. And he is doing a focused recruitment drive around Aviemore and Granton. Um, when you look at the staffing figures on that, Aviemore is at nine, um, and it should be at, at ten. But as with all retained um, uh, stations, people's circumstances are changing, employment's changing. You know. Uh, the days of picking up a job and, and remaining in a village or town and, and being available all the time are changing. People have to commute and travel. So we're taking cognizance of that. And, and, and you know, what we have is we, we can take people on um, uh, a, a dif different contracts and different availability systems, which allows us to go over those establishment numbers slightly. And that's why I'm keen, um, you know, to, to recruit more uh, in Aviemore and Granton. Um, you know, granted, ideally, I'd be looking at getting them up to 20 if I can. So there is scope for taking, you know, more staff on and we're, we're keen to do that. Um, and if you can help in any way, uh, councillors, with, with that and spread that word, then it would be very much appreciated. But, you know, um, it, it will help us and help the communities help themselves as well. So that's all I'll say in terms of the report. I'm happy to take any questions in relation to the content of the report, if that's OK, Chair. Thank you, Bruce. And, you know, if, if there is a, a Facebook um, post, for example, or Twitter or something like that, that, that we can share and, and generally encourage people to join the fire service, um, I'm sure we'd all be happy to do that. Um, I've right. got a couple of questions, you know, yep. one of which is about staffing. I think it would maybe help us if there was an additional column which would tell us um, what the maximum complement you would expect on, on station availability rather than just the number you have. So that when we see a drop, uh, we can assess whether it's a big drop or whether it's just a tiny drop. Um, and my my second, my most important question is, you you do still do a lot of hot fire and uh, home fire and fire safety visits. Yeah. Um, how is that be? How is the, I suppose, the rollout of um, the the new re legislation regarding smoke smoke and heat detectors going? And and are you assisting maybe people who are less able? Um, uh, during the process. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, well, um, first of all, the, the first point, yeah, I'm happy to add a column into that to show what the actual um, real crewing levels should be to show you any deficiencies. I'm happy to get that in for the next report. I'll take a note of that and pass that through to our admin team. Uh, in terms of the new um, smoke detection legislation, um, yeah, it's been quite a challenge, I think, for everybody, um, both in terms of, um, you know, people that own properties and are living in properties trying to obtain smoke detectors. I think that's been a real challenge um, and that hasn't been helped by a, a sort of global shortage of, I think it was semiconductors with the, the production of these devices. Um, in terms of what we do as a service, we will continue to go out and deliver home fire safety visits. We generally don't supply or fit um, the interlinked ones. Um, we advise people and signpost them um, to the Scottish government's website, because it is obviously a Scottish government uh, piece of legislation and initiative. Um, what we do do 
um, is where we identify somebody that is at very high risk and simply cannot provide these for themselves, then where we have capacity and have supply, we will fit the appropriate detectors. We too are, are facing challenges, I'll be honest with that, trying to obtain um, interlinked and in particular the heat ones. But what we will do is an absolute minimum is we will still fit, even if it's a, a short term stop gap until we can get other stuff or they can get other stuff themselves, we will, we will fit something of some kind of smoke detectors, um, even if it's single point ones in the meantime. But that's only uh, as an emergency measure until such time as the occupier or owner can provide their own. Yeah. Well, that's really excellent. Thank you very much for that. OK. Thank you and thank you for the comprehensive report and that's really good news that you're offering support to households. I know the shortage has been a big challenge of, of some of these um, things. I'm delighted that you've mentioned um, you, that your home visits are hopefully getting back to some sort of normality. Um, does that include businesses as well? Because some businesses have been contacted that they were struggling to get um, support. Uh, it's businesses where they rent their office space and I think that's a really uh, important one to ensure these uh, groups are, are still supported. And the youth work I think is absolutely crucial and I hope um, that you get the support you need to be able to work with our schools and I'm sure we as, as uh, members and as a council will um, try and support you in any way we can to make sure you've got access, whether it's indoors, outdoors or, or whatever, because I think uh, it's important to reach the cohort of uh, young people um, in the community before possibly um, behaviours bad behaviours can, can come in. I don't mean bad behaviours, but just to guidance and advice. And I think there's there's nothing better than uh, the fire brigade turning up and speaking to them. Uh, that, that really work, works well. Um, you also mentioned your, your staff. I know um, the recruitment is a is um has been a bit of a challenge across the board but you you're talking about flexible working is that what you mean so you can have maybe two or three part-time staff to make up a um full-time equivalent cohort is that the sort of thing you're looking at okay three questions there councillor I, I, can i come can i answer them one at a time if i may um and, and I'll, I'll put the question back to you you mentioned business support in particular um, people that are perhaps um, I don't know, um, subletting offices, for example. What kind of support is it you're, you're, you're on about? Um, because home fire safety visit is only for dwellings. If it is some kind of fire safety legislation guidance, um, then, you know, in terms of getting their fire risk assessment um, looked at, then that would be directed to the fire safety enforcement team. Uh, through the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. If you if you want, if, if there's anybody in particular you're aware of, and I'm quite happy if you send me that off table and I can I can forward that through to our fire safety uh, business team. Um, I know that in, in terms of auditing, um, because it's not my particular field of expertise, but I believe in terms of fire safety enforcement audits, um, where it, where where, restric where restrictions were at their worst and we simply could not get out for our own safety, but also companies didn't want you in care homes, for example, are an example of that, you know. Um, what they did was they, they carried out telephone audits, remote audits, which were then backed up when when um, the time was right and, 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 and conditions were safer with actual boots on the ground, going in, visiting premises, giving them support and checking their fire risk assessments and, and you know, pointing in the right direction. Um, I believe that, that that's back in place, so that should be happening. But if there's anything that you know of that you want to bring to my attention that I can pass to the team, I'm happy to take that off table. So hopefully that answers the first one, if it does, the business support one. The second one in terms of youth work, um, and you'll have to forgive me, I'm not from the area. I've moved up and I'm, I'm, I'm committed to the area. I will be up working out of Inverness headquarters, um, and, and I, you know, I've got an excellent team underneath me that that manage, you know, the local areas that, that I'm responsible for. Um, but I don't know some of the schools and education establishments, but um, I know that I, I was in charge of Murray before I came up to Highland Central, and 
it's the same issues and the same um, things we've got. It's just a different geography. That's really the fundamentals of it. So for me, I'm very keen to get to know the area a little bit better. I'm very keen to, when the opportunity arises, um, because, you know, the schools have had a tough time. They've had a tough time in terms of um, you know, trying to continue to provide the education, trying to make sure the exams are done. And so the scope for, to, for us to go in, understandably, just wasn't there. And we get that. But if that opportunity exists now, and I'm thinking, you know, typical times are ahead of Easter holidays, ahead of summer holidays, you know, to give that little bit of intervention and support. I'm absolutely up for, for you know, for endorsing that in the area and making sure that that happens. Um, and I'll direct my station commanders, you know, to, to carry out such initiatives, um, you know, uh, leading up to those times. But it's very much dependent on the capacity of the schools. Because we don't, you know, there are exams going on just now. There are, there are hires and, 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 you know, loads of things going on. So it'll be, a, a, you know, a, a, I suppose, um, to fit in with their capacity. But happy to support that. Um, and it also does, you know, other than other than you know that engagement, other than just hopefully helping prevent willful fire raising, for example, it also gives us an opportunity to plant the seed for future recruits. You know, so it does a number of things. Um, and the last bit is in terms of your staff recruitment. Um, you, you want me to expand a little bit about what, the, what I meant by flexibility and establishment for a we call them RDS. We've got volunteers which are slightly different. If we talk about the retained duty system, um, generally speaking, when somebody comes on um, to take up a, a position, uh, let's just call it a full establishment, 100% availability, that counts for 120 hours a week. And we do have flexibility where we can we can take people on that maybe just can't commit to that, but on a 75%, so it's 90 hours a week. And there is a there's a, 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 a retained and volunteer duty system working group just now looking at a raft of things to do with um, conditions and ways to engage, recruit, contractual issues, loads of things. It's, it's a strategic piece of work that's going on in service to look at that and see how that shapes up for the future and also what increased flexibility we can give. But in terms of the establishment figure, I guess where I'm coming at is if you take Abby Moore, for example, Right. They're maybe sitting, I think they sat at nine, didn't they? It was on their figures and it should be 10. If, say, seven of those members of staff are restricted, that gives me a bit of wriggle room that I could maybe go to 12 or 13, you know, because I've got the number of hours there to offer me that flexibility. Um, so that's what I mean by that in terms of going over what's the standard establishment. It gives me the capacity um, to, to change that um as I, as I see fit and as as, as meet, meets the needs of that station and community so hopefully does that answer your question councillor yep brilliant okay thank you Councillor Hadley. hi bruce i'm hoping it's quite a straightforward question um with awareness that you've said there is a difficulty in getting a hold of some of the devices that are needed to bring everybody up to legislation at the moment, is there a system in place whereby if you were to visit, say, a home for a fire safety audit um, and you noticed that they were not in receipt of the various things that they needed, you have some way of supporting them? approaching landlord to ensure that it is done. Um, I'm lucky enough that I'm with the council, so everything was done properly and in good time. But I'm aware that there are some locals that are letting their properties that haven't had any recent upgrades. And would you support them in making it happen? I think I know where you're coming from with that question. I think if I'm right, is that that would be aimed. Well, there's, there's two there's two schools to that. We, we don't audit home fire safety. We go in and we conduct support visits. It's not an audit as such. It's more, you know, you, we've got fire safety audits, but we have no um, legal right, as I, I would suggest, to go in and audit people's private dwellings. But we do it and we can ask them if we want to go in and we can offer, because it's not just about checking detectors, it's about, you know, just a fresh pair of eyes going in to say, well, look at that cable or consider your candles. Or There's loads of different it's other safety aspects that we, we look at. Then it can be quite good. It could be quite a good prompt for occupiers to get that support. Um, in terms of if we see something that doesn't quite comply, we can offer advice, but it's not our place to police that as such. My understanding is that when, and it is only my understanding, I probably have to clarify this, in terms of policing and, and uh, enforcing that new legislation, that will really come at 
the time of any building applications, um, the time of selling properties, that sort of thing is where it will be picked up and enforced properly. In terms of, I think this was part of your question, if you had somebody in a rental, a private rental, and the uh, the fire safety or the, the, the fire alarm um, smoke detector measures didn't comply with the new legislation, would we do anything about that? Um, we would offer advice to the occupier, but the occupier would have to then go back to the landlord because the landlords, if you're renting, my understanding is you're renting a property, they should be registered. Yeah, so that's where that would get picked up. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, folks. I'm happy to, to take anything, you know. But but that's kind of where I see our our place in all of that is very much uh, to advise, uh, but not to police that. Yeah. Hopefully Councilor. that answers it, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Bruce. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for all that information. Uh, I just want to ask the relationship between the fire service and forestry estates because i think we've done quite well this year with uh well last year with lack of fires um and i'd just be interested to know what you expect the states to do to control any forestry fires and what you would do as well thank you okay thank you you've, you've caught me off guard a little bit with that one but i'll do my best to, to sort of measure it um i could you know we're not knowing yet the area fully uh, you know and the landowners etc yet okay. um in my previous role in Murray, um we we ran some very very good initiatives and i'm sure correct me if i'm i'm sure these will have happened in your area but they will they will definitely get reinvigorated uh, reinvigorated this year uh, i'll ask for that to happen um is that we 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 ran initiatives um in some of the larger wooded areas uh, rosile woods for example Huge area, huge area yeah. that we that, and that we identified there were some wolf of fires in. So we, we felt it appropriate to run some initiatives with the countryside rangers, with some retained volunteers, with the police, with various you know partners. Um, and it was it was more you know printing off QR codes, putting them you know to 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 websites to to talk about you know. Um, safe use of the countryside and we ran these over weekends and, and I see that as quite a quite a useful um, type of event um, as well as that I know that there are there are um, um, landowners groups set up I don't know if you've got one in your area yet um, but I feel that's we, again when I was in Murray through conjunction you know through partnership with the police we actually had a, a landowners group that would meet once a quarter and it wasn't just about willful fire raising. It was about other issues within people's land that might, that police might pick up on, you know, whether it's people driving through, causing damage. And I found that quite a useful meeting and quite a useful partnership because it opened opportunity for us to know the landowners and for us to have a relationship with them. Um, and, to, you know, so for, if things like, you know, initiatives come up, we've got a point of contact and we're listening to their needs as well. Um, so that might be something that I don't know whether you would be in a position or somebody would be in a position to supply me with some names that I can that I can you know mm -hmm. I, I can take off table and speak to the, uh, the you know the, the sort of chief inspector for police to see if there's an appetite to do something similar in this area I don't know you know but, but again I guess some of that will be dependent on incident activity whether there's a real risk um, but as I said there those meetings aren't just about risk it's about the relationship and it's about of an understanding mm -hmm. uh, of the of you know the landowners um but yeah i'm happy to support if there, if there's known areas and you'll know the area better than me at the moment mm -hmm. <laughs> i will get up to speed but i've got my team under me but so forgive my vagueness mm -hmm. a little bit but if there's a need there where we we know there's you know no pun intended hot spots within certain parts of you know forestry or or, or you know rural areas then we can target those um with um, initiatives, safety initiatives around raising awareness of that. And I noticed that I think Duncan's on the call. He's, he's, he's worked with me in the past. The media is a very, very powerful thing and, and we can tap into our own media team and seek assistance for the council and any partners that we have to send out that sort of message when the time's right. But, but if there's a particular area of concern that you want to raise, please um, contact me off, off table and I, I can look into that and, and you know, direct some work in that in that way if it's required. 
Thanks, Bruce. I, I see this almost as an insurance, you know, knowing where things are in the ward for, for in case a fire does break out. That, that, that's what I was thinking of really for the future. But thanks very much. But that, and that's great. Yeah, thanks. And the, the thing is, we do have a resource out there in terms of, you know, um, what, community response units, you know, who, who have dedicated equipment. To give you, just to close that point off, we are working on, on something just now, which is a national wildfire project. And that's looking at a number of things. It's also looking at the way we tackle wildfires. You know, we've learned a lot from some of the estate workers. For example, leaf blowers, different tactics, burn backs. You know, our traditional methods of fighting wildfires uh, need to change, and they will change. But obviously, that's going to take a little bit of time in terms of procurement of equipment, training, etc. But we, there's 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 move afoot in terms of that. Okay. Bruce, I think one of the big advantages you've got locally is is Roddy Chapman is is a local boy. He'll know far more about the entire area than many of us do. So um, I think he's a big asset to you at the moment. Um, and, and we're able to help for anything that you think we can help with. Any questions you might have about the operation of the area, probably the best person to contact is Liz Cowie, our ward manager. And, I, and I'm sure she can put you in touch with police contacts, etc. And, and from a personal point of view, I'd really like to thank you for the very comprehensive report and answers today. It's really refreshing. So really, thank you very much. Um, and again, you're welcome to stay, but I'm sure you've got better things to do. I will I'll pop off, but can I, just the same back to yourselves. It's very nice to meet you all. Um, and, you know, when the opportunity permits, hopefully we will get around the table and meet in person. Um, but again, likewise, uh, you know, we are here to support our communities and help the communities. Um, and if there's anything at all, uh, don't feel shy or, you know, to I know you wouldn't, to reach out, um, either myself or Roddy, and we'll do anything, anything we can to help the areas. Politicians okay. are not shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Indeed. Thanks very nice much to meet you all. Yeah. Thanks now. Bye-bye. Bye. Members, we move now to item five on our agenda, which is notices of motion. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll just start as I'm the first signatory. Members, at a time when this council has declared a climate emergency, it would seem quite unbelievable that we should be putting barriers in place which will ultimately lead to a reduction in the level of service for passengers. The removal of functioning ticket offices from our two main uh, mainline railway stations will make it more difficult for passengers to use the train uh, as an alternative to the private car. There's evidence from elsewhere that um, when electronic ticket machines break down, what happens is it causes confusion and distress to passengers who then have to explain to, uh, uh, I suppose, a ticket officer on the train that they've, they've actually bought a ticket. And, and they'll need to provide a method to prove that, or they're going to have to buy another ticket. And also, many of the I suppose the cheaper rate tickets that are available, you can you can only get either face to face or on the internet. And if you don't have access to the internet, how do you buy a train ticket? I, I think this is just a piece of nonsense that's been thought up in some way to save a minuscule amount of money. Um, and, and one of the big things that you could, they could do is sort of the chicken and the egg scenario. You need more people to get on the trains before you can get more trains. Well, bring the fares down to an acceptable level and you will get more people. Um, so I, I, it's quite simple for me, members. Um, rail travel is far too expensive. There's not enough trains um, and the, the trains that are there quite often have not enough carriages. So members, I really hope you will support this motion. And, and I move to Councillor Hadley. Um, thank you very much, convener. Um, what to say without repeating anything you've said? We've, um, of recent years, we've had a return to tourism, the likes of which I haven't seen in about 30, 40 years. And we should be encouraging the use of our trains and we should be encouraging the manned use of the ticket offices. We've got a reputation as a friendly 
um, area to visit filled with happy faces and people that are pleased to see you. And we'll be reducing that to automatic systems that, as Bill has pointed out, often don't work. Um, from an accessibility angle, speaking with the, the local ticket office lady, she'd mentioned that there were issues with accessibility for disabled people with one of the platforms not currently working. And she pointed out that it's widely recognised that the removal of one member of staff is the equivalent to putting in a set of stairs for less abled people and it is prohibitive with the use of the stations for all. Um, uh, with regard to the fares, we are chiefly in a very low wage economy and it's been widely recognised that the cost of living does not meet the wages that we receive in the local area. And with regard to that, some of the shifts that can be gained by local people can be as little as four hours a day. When you consider that a one-way ticket to Aviemore can be more than half of what they would receive in an hour's wages, or a return would actually exceed what they would earn in an hour's wages, people can be taking the train to work to earn the equivalent then of three hours or less for a four-hour shift because of the price of the, the, the transport. Now, with a move to buses being free for certain age groups, we should be seeking to increase the use of public transport for our young people because the majority of them cannot afford to purchase and then run a car on the minimum hour, minimum wage contracts they get. And we need to, we need to see far more investment um, in our railways and improvement and not a restriction of service and hours. Um, so I hope, like Bill, you'll be able to add your, your approval to this motion. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you, Chair. I would like to add an amendment to this motion. Um, if you can bear with me, if that's um, agreeable, uh, Chair. I think the proposal should be stopped in its entirety because the new owner, uh, the Scottish Government, is taking over in April. And I think a full assessment with evidence-based needs for the services should be a, or must be undertaken with staff and locals at the heart of this. I want to see, um, I totally agree, it's far too expensive. I want to take some of the buses off the road so our young people can get to community high school using a one ticketing system. So that is what I would suggest. This, you know, the new owner and the new takes over in April. And I think this, this is just a silly thing that the current operator is doing. And I think we need a full, uh, needs assessment uh, for what um, to protect employment, to give the people that are working there, they'll have the good ideas uh, to reach uh, and, and to ensure reach for safety and support. Thank you. So what would your amendment be? You're on mute. Sorry, I do apologise. Uh, the amendment is that this, that all proposals are stopped now until there is the new uh, operator, which is the Scottish Government, takes over and then full consultation with ourselves, obviously, but the locals and the staff and a needs-based assessment. I'm happy to take any word changes, but that's... Councillor Hadley. Um, just with awareness that the they've had the consultation which they may argue has already been undertaken um which i think closed on the 2nd of february but the consultation has already been opened and then put out it may be that they've already they may argue that that's already been done uh, that's all that i'd like to observe yeah I, I don't disagree with that pippa i think but it seems a bit foolhardy that a consultation is going on on uh, is being conducted by an operator that's lost the franchise um, that's my interpretation, but I absolutely agree. I, I, it should never have taken place, but it was whether or not the amendment would that part of it, whether you're asking for the consultation would stand if they're in the process of having completed one, I presume. Can I make can I make a suggestion then um, in the, the notice of motion in, in the final line, we agree to write to Scottish, the Scottish Government uh, Minister of Transport highlighting our concern and asking that any changes are halted um, prior to the introduction of the new operator. I'm happy to be a signature to that. Yes, thank you. Well, it would actually be Councillor Hadley would be the signature. Okay. You okay with that, Pippa? 
Yes, I can't claim to understand what's just gone on, but yes. <laughs> well, well, I it's, it's, it's to back to the bottom. Yeah, it's just it's just adding an extra line onto the bottom. You happy with that, Muriel? And anyone disagree? Okay, we'll do that as a motion. Um, Liz, do you have a note of? Um, in fact, it's not Liz, it's Lorraine. Lorraine, do you have a note of um, what the final motion will be? I do, Chair. You're just wanting to add on to the end um, after highlighting our concerns and asking that any changes are halted prior to introduction of the new operator. Is that correct? Yes, and and I would, uh, bearing in mind we're, we've agreed to write to uh, Scottish Minister, then I could write on all of our behalf, if you're happy with that. Okay. Item six is the Area Roads Capital Programme, and we have Richard Porteous and possibly Colin Hill. I don't know. Yes, we do. We have Colin Hill here as well. So I don't know which of you gentlemen is starting off, but um, don't fight over it. Richard. Thanks very much, Chairman, members. Uh, yes, so this is the um, Area Roads Capital Programme for 2022-23. Uh, and members are asked to approve the program. Um, the, first of all, apologies, as you stated at the beginning of the committee, that there was a typo and uh, that's embarrassing. And thankfully, these don't happen very often. So there's a donation going to somebody's favourite charity to compensate for that embarrassment. <laughs> no, we get them. We get all of our money, do we not? <laughs> I wish I'd never mentioned it now. So um, thanks very much. The the report, um, I won't read through the report. It's, it's self-explanatory detailing where the monies come from and how the monies are allocated. Um, uh, in section uh, 5.1, the table uh, details the amount of money anticipated to be available next year, which is similar to, to this year. Um, and the, when we get the final figures, um, we will then be able to uh, establish exactly how much we're going to be able to achieve. But the priorities are listed in Appendix 2, and that's what members are asked to, to approve today. And so that is the short list uh, for all the various works outstanding in the area, which is obviously considerably longer. But you can see that uh, the total in Appendix 2, uh, 784910, comes to more than... Um, the money that we're anticipating to get. So, however, it includes a large contingency there for storm storm damage. So, we we're com confident um, that we should be able to deliver all those items in in the program. And as usual, it's it's a question of trying to make the money that we do have go as far as possible. Um, so, surface dressing features large in the program, being the most uh, cost effective way of covering as much of the network as possible in, in preventative maintenance. But due to the current condition of the programme, it's 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 very much stitch in time. Um, you can see uh, in items three, four, five and six, uh, it's focusing on the Brazer Castle Grant roads. Um, this year, we're grateful to be receiving the, the capital money that we, we're we're getting. Next year, the way things stand at the moment, the uh, capital monies will reduce again. So we're spending the money on, on the Brazer Castle grant while we have it. Otherwise, we're going to lose that road completely. Um, so with a combination of the, the overlay work identified in row nine, and those I've just mentioned um, in three, four, five and six, uh, we'll hopefully uh, managed to uh, catch that road before it de deviate, uh, deteriorates uh, to a point where we'd have to spend crazy amounts of money on, on it. Um, and the other items at the top of the surface dressing list, uh, obviously we, we prioritise the, the, the A and B roads and uh, it's been, it, it, it's over seven years now since we did significant uh, surface dressing on these roads and surface dressing treatment will protect the road for, uh, it'll reseal it and protect the road and, and extend its life for between five and 10 years. So it's 
it's high time we, we recommenced uh, the A and B roads in the area um, before it gets too late. So that, that's us able to make a start uh, on the B9152 and all of the B9150 from Newton Moore to, to the A9. Um, and the overlay work, we've been over the last few years trying to again save the, the Glen Truham Road. So this will be, there's three remaining short sections there which will then complete that. And so it's all complete, we, we've saved the road. So uh, we're, we're, we're pleased about that. Uh, and another one, if we don't spend the money now, it'll be too late, is the Tom Bain uh, section uh, north of Granton there as well. Other than that, um, sorry about this, I'm pleased to say that was my phone going off. I'm pleased to say that we've got uh, some other monies, um, which it's a different budget. There's a strategic fund um, that was made, made available this year for capital spending as well. And so we've got some of that, I'm pleased to say, earmarked for the, the uh, A939 Bridge of Brown Road. Um, it, as I say, it's a different budget, so it doesn't affect this total. So it's, it's in as a zero against against uh, row 16, but actually it's about £160,000 worth of work that will be done up there as well, which is tremendous. Um, and th these other rows at the bottom, um, which detail and remind works that will be taking place, and they, again, they're priorities, but we've managed to source funding elsewhere. So that, that's one of them. The other one is the Glenmore. Uh, parallel parking improvements that are taking place along uh, Loch Morlich side uh, through visitor infrastructure improvement funding uh, and in collaboration with the National Park. Um, so that's ongoing at the moment using a local contractor and uh, all parties seem to be very happy with, with the works at the moment. And <laughs> that's been one bonus to the, the mild winter is that we've, we've got on pretty well with that so far. Um, there's probably not much more to add uh, in terms of a general update. It has been a very mild winter. I reckon it's about 60% of the normal amount of morning turnouts so far with gritting, 50% of evening turnouts. So it's been a very mild winter. Um, hopefully that means there'll be, it'll take less of a toll on the network in terms of water damage and freeze thaw action, uh, which will always help because um, we'll be focusing as ever when it comes to cyclical works on, on pothole repairs, as well as all the other activities from parish maintenance through to uh, refreshing markings and um, all our other usual activities, drainage, of course. Um, what else could I update on? Uh, it's been relatively quiet as well for emergency call outs, although we've obviously had Storm, Mickle and Corrie to deal with in terms of significant number of wind blown trees. Uh, thankfully, other other uh, emergencies such as flooding, ponding, touch wood have been relatively minimal this, this winter so far too. I guess we've got the rest of uh, February and, and summer March to come, come yet. Um, in terms of back, coming back to capital spending, we've got a couple of items outstanding from this year's existing budget, though members did receive a, an update at the last committee. Uh, but so the two outstanding items of note are Station Road Junction in Newton Moor and Seafield Place in Aviemore for surfacing. Um, and that is still planned to take place before the end of March. Other than that, uh, if I've missed anything, please ask. and. Uh, Happy to take any other questions. Thank you. Yeah, Rachel, thank you for that. Um, I, I think maybe if you put your microphone on mute, Richard. Okay, you know, Richard, I'm probably fed up saying this. I, I think we really appreciate the, the work that the union staff do in our area. I think they do a fantastic job with very, very limited resources. And I'm yet again going to speak about the limited resources. For many, many years, this has been the Cinderella operation of Highland Council. It's been completely underfunded and it needs to be properly funded. We need more money spent on roads, ditches, bridges and everything else. And it's high time that this council began to appreciate it. 
it's it, it's if no longer be considered a service that we cannot put money into. And when I hear you saying today that there are a number of roads that unless we spend money on them, there will no longer be roads. I, I really, the council needs to take that on board. We need to spend more money on this service. And that's a simple fact of life. And I, and I hope that when the council budget comes forward next month, that that will be given due consideration. So the only question I've got is, is regarding the Rutherford Bridge. And can you say, do we have a permanent solution regarding the, the surface? But I'll take Councillor Hadley first, and then you can maybe answer some questions at the end. Councillor Hadley. Um, you probably read my mind there, convener, because one of the questions, well, it was an observation that um, the Glen Truim Road being fixed will appease some of the detractors of the Ruthven Bridge, as it appears that there's been a little bit of disruption to the road service surface following the improvements that were made, obviously, on a night that you were stormbound. Um, because why would it do anything else on the night that you had road improvements to do? Um, my question, I think, is mixed in with a bit of a compliment to say that although we often hear um, negative statements about the condition of the roads, what I've heard is consistently positive statements about the reactivity of having the trees cleared. Um, the fact that the guys were out in all hours clearing up some of the damage, that some of the blocked roads were cleared really quickly and everybody was super impressed with the reaction of the council to the clearing up after the storms. Um, and the question that comes in all of that, are you, is it shifting it into a winning balance? I can see that you've got a storm contingency fund set aside, but then you've also mentioned that you've potentially saved on some of the winter costs. Is that balance shifting in your favour? Is the storm costing you less financial and man hour wise than the, the damage to the roads from extreme cold would have done. Chairman, uh, thanks. Uh, I'll answer those in reverse order. In terms of re reacting to storms, uh, yes, it's a saving in terms of overtime, particularly, and, and other cost of other machinery, etc. If we're if we're on vehicles that we're not having to, to respond in out of hours. Um, and the yeah, if it's a milder winter, there'll be uh, the repairs to the road network will be less costly. There'll be less potholing, um, less water damage, less freeze thaw, resulting in uh, you know uh, again aggravating potholes, cracking of the road, and general deterioration of all assets. So that will be a, a long-term saving. Obviously, there's another short-term saving in that we're we're spending less on road salt uh, and again overtime you know, if we're gritting in the, the wee small hours so yeah it has saved it's always um been uh, mutually exclusive so if we, if we spend less on winter we've got more available for cyclical uh, because it all comes out of the same revenue budget having said that the revenue budget is is extremely tight as we know um i won't go into that <laughs> any further just to, to answer the question on um Ruthven bridge yeah there is a plan for that um as soon as possible it will be fully re fully re-waterproofed and resurfaced um and the structures team are, are working on that obviously if they could do it now they would but it's it's weather dependent work so it'll depend on the the milder conditions as we go through the spring into the summer and uh yeah it was classic uh, terrible weather on the night that uh, the repairs were done. And of course, we're grateful that the, those repairs were done because it's been a huge improvement. Um, and if they tried to do more, they, they wouldn't have achieved it all in the time available, always knowing that they may have to go back and do another temporary repair before we get to the, the permanent ones. There's a lot of timber being extracted and coming out over that bridge and with large vehicles, wet conditions and um, the deteriorating surface, there's, there's going to be more potholing. So we're keeping an eye on the keeping the temporary repairs repairs done day to day. And uh, it looks like we may have to action another temporary repair. Um, so we'll keep you fully informed on that one. And again, try and avoid disruption to everybody in the area from the dis distillery to the, the school buses. Um, and Glen Truim, yeah, no, thanks. It's good to get that positive feedback there. So I'll feed that back to the team. 
Richard, will the permanent um, repair of the bridge require it to be closed for any substantial period? And I'm, I'm just asking as a guess, maybe. Chairman, yes, it will. Um, we'll try and keep it to a minimum. And obviously there'll be full consultation and uh, around the timing and diversion route as well. Yeah, but um, I can't say how many days it will take, but it, it will be. And there will be it will result in a bit of disruption for everybody locally, unfortunately, so it's a shame that it has to be done again so soon after the bridge was built, but it's just. It's one of those things. Yeah, I'm sure we'll cope. Thanks, on Bruce. Thanks, Chair. Um, surface dressing. Uh, if you were given all the money in the world, uh, would you still do a surface dressing or is there something better than the surface dressing that you'd really like to do? Because this five years, it just sort of sounds as if you're putting on a sticking plaster and it wears off after it gets wet a few times. Um, and I'm just concerned that are, are we sort of storing up big expenditure by just surface dressing and not doing something more? Thanks, Richard. Chairman, it's actually the other way around. I'll have to um, put you straight on that one and anyone else because it's preventative maintenance. So if we didn't do surface dressing, all roads would deteriorate, deteriorate at a faster rate, but it extends the life of the road. But it, it, re, it seals, seals the surface, stops water ingress, stops the oxidization, oxidization of the surface layers of tar, and uh, extends the road life by 10 years. So for th four or five pounds a square meter compared to 25, 30 pounds a square meter for resurfacing, it's it's an invaluable tool and something that we must do. Otherwise, uh, you know, we're just, it's a missed opportunity. And we'd I, so we'd ideally, if it extends the life of the road by 10 years, ideally we'd like to do a 10th of the network every year. But this year we're, is the best year we've had. We're planning to do more than we've done for the last five or six years this year, and it's only 5% of the network. So um, and next year it'll be back down to about 2%. So it's uh, okay. the right. more well, thanks we do very surface much. dressing, the better. Thanks. Right. Thank you. That's a cool board. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Richard, for the, as ever, the detailed report. Um, I'm a huge fan of prevention and, and you've mentioned your, your five percent there but do we need to support you uh, and the teams to get some um, support from some of the landowners regarding ditches because there seems to be you know an increase in water and there's less some landowners are quite good but on the whole we seem to be getting uh, less support out there and there's an expectation the council will fix it um, so that's one question. My other question is, um, you mentioned pavements um, in, in the report. One of the problems we've got in Granton and in Newton Moore, we've got trees that have uh, brought up the pavements um, and that's a, that's a huge risk, uh, it's a cost to the council. Uh, what sort of plan of action have we got for that? Chairman? Um, just going back to my program to remind myself, we have got a footway inlay in row 15, which is that very footway perhaps you're mentioning in Seafield Avenue in Granton on Spey. So, um, yeah, that's probably the worst one, uh, hence why it's top of the list. But, um, yeah, so footways, as you know, over recent years have taken a back seat. However, they're inspected um, uh, at the same level as the roads are, and uh, any safety defects we're constantly having to address to keep on top of the, on top of that. But in terms of the general condition, then there's obviously has been a deterioration over the last 25 years, uh, as less and less money has been been spent on regular maintenance of, of, and surfacing and, and slurry sealing, which is uh, the equivalent of surface dressing uh, on a footway. Has basically become non-existent, so they're 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 gradually deteriorating. Um, so we would love love more money to spend on footway maintenance, 
um, tree roots is, is a problem on some of our roads as well. Um, Loch and Dorb is a problem. I was talking about this yesterday. Ach Lane, the Ach Lane Road down near Glenfeshi and uh, the Bogroy Road at Car Bridge. All problems with tree roots there. And it's very frustrating because it can be a root that's only, you know, an inch to two inches in diameter and it'll raise the road surface by five to six inches. So we, we basically have to plane that off and uh, patch it and dig out the root. Um, ideally, you would want to dispose of the tree, but that's not really an option most of the time. So it's just uh, a ticking tree root uh, waiting to grow again and, and cause the same problem again. But it, yeah, it's quite a problem around the highlands, the, the tree root one. Um, but what you're saying there about uh, about uh, talking to landowners about ditching is is really important. And I'm going to big up my boss now because we now have I've been talking to you for ages about that extra te technician that we've been short of. Well, we now have that extra technician thanks to Colin Hill. So got to give him the credit. He's due for that because it's it's going to make a massive difference, particularly for that sort of thing where you, you've got a body that can be proactive in engaging with local landowners and partners uh, to, to get the benefit there so that they're doing, encourage them to do the work that they should be doing so that we don't end up having to do it. Having said that, there's, there's loads of other things this technician will be doing, not just that. Um, but that that's kind of the icing on the cake in many ways. Um, so we've got more opportunity to, to do these things now. Thanks. Councillor Hardy, do you want to back in? Sorry, it was just something that came to mind when John was asking his question about the surfacing. Um, and it, it, the answer could be likened to the fissure seals for dentists. You know, you put fissure seals on to preserve the surface of your teeth. And ideally, you could take out all of your teeth and implant new ones. But it's not what you prefer to do. You prefer just to make them last a wee bit longer without having to go through that. Um, and then some, thank you, Colin, for, for being able to secure extra work. And it was just to mention the, the ideal example of tree roots meeting road is the other side of Tromi Bridge, where the road has miraculously maintained its structure and its integrity. But it's allowed for tree roots to come along that are more akin to sleeping policemen. Um, and the road seems to be holding firm. So, we, yeah, that's a good example of just how much they can disrupt. Thank you for letting me back in, Chair. So, Richard, I, I think you've heard that um, how supportive we all are, and um, I think that's something that Colin will want to take away, that we really appreciate the fact just how well the service works here. Um, you don't hear too many complaints about our roadways here, and I think that's mostly down to how well they're, they're looked after, um, and not quite down to how much money is spent on them, which, as I said earlier, needs to be a lot more. Um, Members, uh, unless you want to say anything yourself, Colin, I'm quite happy to hear from you if you wish. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now that was uh, it was very reassuring to hear the hear the words. And 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 can I make a a, a slight uh, uh, admission as well? I mean, I am guilty of having read Richard's report, so I will take the full responsibility for Lakaba uh, sneaking in. Uh, th there's another mistake in the report, actually, as well, members. It, the 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 it, appendix one. The, the actual amount of investment we're making on roads, uh, the, the total revenue and capital, uh, there's an error in our maths, would you believe? And that's a disgrace coming from an engineer. So so we're actually investing 35.44 million uh, in in this financial year. And, and you are seeing the benefits of that investment. The other thing I'd say, Chair, is um, you know, the, the, to remind members of the good work we're doing through the redesign board and the engineering redesign process. In, some of you members would have attended the workshops and uh, and we're taking a paper to the redesign board uh, on the 18th. And, and I've been very uh, pleased with the input that we've had from members and and clearly the opportunities we've got to try and improve the service going forward. So so thank you members. G good debate and I'm very pleased with the outcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you both. Members, you're asked to approve the, the programme uh, under the recommendations. Can we agree that please? OK. Members, item seven on the agenda is the Baddock and Strathspey Ward Placed Investment Funds funding allocations. 
Liz Cowie. Good morning. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Members. Um, the report before you follows on from the decisions taken by members at the August and November area committees in 2021 with, the, in, with regard to Ward 20's Police Base Investment Funds. The first recommendations ask members to agree the reallocation and retention of funds from those agreed at the August 9th area committee. And these are to reallocate the remaining balance of 9,500 via the Community Challenge Fund, which increased the funding available for allocation to £64,500. The second point was to build upon the feasibility studies and business case already developed and targeting the remaining funds of £1,700 in support of concluding the joint work started with the Cairngorm Business Partnership on a Housing for Businesses project. We also are looking to utilise the funding of £10,000 that was allocated for investigating the um, audit of empty commercial units and proposals for potential solutions. And it's um, proposed to utilise this funding to investigate potential support to local businesses now based on the finding of the audit. And the total funding pot for community regeneration projects of 64500 comprises the 50000 allocated at the November Area Committee, Nine and a half thousand re reallocated from the housing needs project, and the five thousand pounds remaining from the total police base investment fund. There was then, following the agreement to open a community challenge fund, there was a very high level of interest in this fund, and the following projects have been brought forward for members' consideration at item two point two. And these are the Aviemore Community Enterprise Myrtlefield Redevelopment Feasibility Study Project. Of fourteen and a half thousand pounds, the Granton Initiative in partnership with Highland Council for the Dooley Play Area and Pitch Project, which is um, a, a very exciting joint project that is being worked across um, a large area, and that's for ten thousand pounds. Um, the Kingusian Vicinity Community Council Glebe Ponds Restoration Feasibility Study at the um, start of the village for nine thousand seven seven nine. Badenoch Heritage Storyland Sessions, and this follows the very successful Badenoch Great Place project, in which the Council was involved with the um, Badenoch Heritage Group and the Cairngorm National Park Authority, and this is for £1,950. Kincraig and Vicinity Community Council Toilet and Parking Feasibility Study, another exciting potential project, and that's £9,312. And the Aviemore and Glenmore Community Trust, the Father Community Land um, and Community Park Feasibility Study of £10,000. And given the need for contingency with the issues that are around supply chain demand, availability and potential cost impacts, a contingency has been put in for provision for play and project development in order to support these projects across the valley. So I'm very happy to take any question members and members be asked to approve the funding allocations and the recommendations. Thank you, members. Thank you, Liz. Um, this is a good paper. Um, so one thing, members, if, if you look at it, in many, many occasions in the past, local communities haven't been able to progress um, ideas that they've got and bring them to fruition. Because in many cases, it takes seed funding to start this off. So you, we, we need to do we need the funding to start off with and they can't find the funding unless they've got the project developed. So I think this really helps. And that's in addition to all the rest of the stuff that, that, that this, um, I suppose, amount of money has brought forward. So really, I think this is really excellent news for our local communities. So it's, no one seems to be want to speak on this, members. Can we? There's a host of recommendations. Oh, sorry, Pippa. Sorry, it was just clarity, and I'm not sure if my brain is just doing a little bit of dyslexia. Um, it was, did you not mention the sum on King Craig and Vincinity Community Council as being 9,312, 9, and the figure is 9,132? Is that me being dyslexic? Have I heard it wrong? It was just for clarity. 312 in the paper. Sorry, the paper that I can read um, says it was proposed to agree the grant application for 9,132. That was in the proposed funding allocations on page four out of five, a point five point five. Sorry, it was just for clarity. I'm not meaning to be difficult. 
the um, I, I do apologise that that title no, was okay. up, and um, it should be nine thousand three hundred and twelve. Thank you. That's what I presumed. I just didn't want it to pass unnoticed. A day for titles, unfortunately. And it that, is. The report we've proofread so many times, and I can only apologise, members, but the recommendation is the correct amount. Can Can I also add, just sorry, Chair, just on the back of that, that it is brilliant to see the, the funding um, allocation coming forward for the feasibility studies, because too many times communities don't feel capable of committing to something because they don't fully understand what it would involve. And this is a great way of seeing how many communities are ready to take on projects that otherwise they might just be slightly intimidated by. Thank you. I'll stop there because the dogs are fighting. I think sometimes we just get word blind reading these things time and time again, and you, you forget about the fact that there's there's two earlier references to to one one sum of money and then a final reference to a different one. So apologies for that. We'll have that corrected. But with that correction, members, as I said, there's a host of recommendations in your paper under item seven. Can we agree them all, please? Thank you. Now move to item eight on the agenda, which is um, slightly confusing because it's very similarly named, but um, is a different project. But um, and I'll now hand over to Alan Webster and, and Alan can talk us through this. Alan. Do I have Alan Webster? Liz. Alan was present um, earlier, but um, I will go and see if I can find out what's happened. If we can maybe move to the next report, if uh, the, the next officer available could come forward, and that would be Debbie Sutton. OK, um, we now move then, we'll pause that item for a minute or two, and, and we'll move to item nine, which is play part provision. And Debbie. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, this is really quite a straightforward report, so I don't tend to talk too much to it. But what uh, we're asking here is for um, members to note the funding which has been committed through the Scottish Government of 55 million over the lifetime of the Parliament and agree that the Scottish Government funding be used in this area, which is £9,474, to replace key items of equipment and any remaining balance be carried over to the next financial year. Uh, following discussion with members, we've also be asking for um, members to agree to carry, uh, to spend, commit the award COVID funds, which are remaining, which is £21,463, to be repurposed for the essential repairs of play equipment that is required in the area, and for the um, funds to be discussed, delegated to the immunities manager and discussed in consultation with the members about how that is um, committed. And also, we would like members to agree the homologation on and the repurposing and the spend of the £7,084.50 of ward COVID funds, which was used to replace an item of equipment in Campbell Crescent in King UC. Um, that's really all I have to say. And if any members have, have any questions, I'm happy to take those. But it's quite straightforward, hopefully. Members, I think it is a straightforward report. There's, there's two items for you to note and three for, for your agreement. So can can we note and agree those? Councillor Hadley. Just wanted to really quickly say thank you so much for the special allocation for the Campbell Crescent Play Park. It has been well used, very much appreciated, and it's a pleasure to see the children enjoying it. Thank you. Thanks. Agreed with all the other comments. Yep. I think we all agree to that. So does everyone agree with those uh, recommendations, members? Thank you. Thank you. Liz, are we anywhere closer with, with Alan? No? No, I'm still trying to see if I can contact him by phone, so I'll just keep trying and I'll update the committee. OK, um, now move then to item 10 members, which is the housing revenue account garage rents. I'm not proposing that um, Jake Mitchell introduces this paper. It's relatively simple. The only question I would have for you members is, uh, do, uh, do, we do we increase the rents by 1%, 1.5% or any other amount? My personal suggestion would be it should be 1% for council tenants and 1.5% one, one and for those who are not council tenants. Um, and, and I would look for a seconder for that or if there are any other proposals. John, is that you seconding that proposal? OK. Muriel? You're on mute. 
bit happy with now that. I've got two screens, it's difficult to find the cursor. But no, I second that, Bill. And you, you're happy with that, Muriel? No problem. So, Jake, I think um, you can take away from that. Since it's agreement from the members, it's 1% for council house tenants and 1.5% for those who are not council house tenants. I don't suppose that will cause you any problem. Thank you. Now, item 11 on your agenda, members, is, is Jake Mitchell again. And Jake, this time, I'd like you to take us through the um, housing performance report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, the, the housing performance report um, before you covers the period up until the 31st December 2021. Um, if I can firstly draw your attention to the tables um, on the report at 5.3 and 5.6, the first of which relates to emergency repairs and the second relating to non-emergency repairs. In both cases, performance in, in Badenoch and Strasbe remains well within target. Moving on to average relet times, the, the table at 6.2 shows that performance is continuing to improve as the year goes on. Uh, and again, it remains within our target, our 35 day target. Section 7 um, on rent arrears, the, the table at 7.2 shows the value of current rent arrears. Um, and I'm pleased to report that this shows an improvement when compared to the previous quarter. Um, or, or indeed the same quarter in the previous year. The area team has a focus on carrying out more rent arrears visits and also using digital methods of communication that have become more, more readily used during the, during the pandemic. Um, section 8 um, around homelessness. Um, as you can see from the report, there have been 10 presentations in quarter 3 which numbers wise is very much within within a, a usual range. Um, and, and lastly, members, I'd, I'll just draw your attention to Appendix 1 on the last page. Um, and at a glance, this just shows that all performance detailed within the report is, is within target. Um, and I'm very happy to take any, any questions on that. Jake, I think um, the, the statistics regarding repairs are, are very welcome. and, and you know, considerably improved. Um, and I think that's really, really excellent. And and regards to arrears, is there any reasoning um, why the arrears should be, I suppose, dropping quite substantially when in the past we've seen them uh, raise in a similar fashion? So is there any particular reason or is it just down to um, better staff engagement, et cetera, et cetera, with tenants? Um, th thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the team have a real focus on, on rent arrears manage management as we emerge from the, from the pandemic. Um, and uh, we, we have capitalised, as I mentioned, on some of these digital contact methods, um, which I think tenants have become more accustomed to using. Um, so perhaps there's a, there's a hidden benefit that's come from that. Um, but yeah, it's very much a focus that the, that the local team have. Members, any further questions? The recommendation is that that you consider the information, which I think we've done. So Jake, thanks very much for your report um, and you. we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. Members, item 12 on the agenda is the Grant and Common Good Asset Register. And we have Sarah Murdoch with us today and I'm sure no one knows more about our common good assets than Sarah does. So Sarah, <laughs> over to you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Is it morning still? Just. Um, yes. Um, the report that's before you details the um, consultation that took place following the investigations into what assets could be considered as common good in Grant and Spay. Um, the recommendations indicate that the contents that have been identified and were consulted upon are contained in the format that would be appropriate for publication, and they're in Appendix 1. Um, when the list went out to consultation, we received um, two um, emails containing um, queries that fortunately we'd investigated in advance. That's the advantage of, of coming at it almost from fresh is that you've already looked at those items rather than having to go back and start again. Um, so we were able to respond to those quite quickly. Um, and they're contained for members' um, attention in 
appendix number two, which details the consultation representations and responses. Um, we have to publish those on the website as well, so they're available for anybody that wants to see them. So the details of the outcome of the, the register consultation itself are contained in paragraph four. Um, that just details how long the consultation ran for um, and the type of inquiries we received. Um, it also considers and, and indicates that um, where the governance for it lies at the moment. And it's felt that whilst the governance lies um, with yourselves at area committee to approve we do have to refer the matter to full council um, to reflect the fact that um, at the moment, Granton has very little in the way of cash assets. And ultimately, um, the council, because common good property is council property, it has to be held separately and apart from ordinary council property, but it is still council property. Um, and there will still be financial implications as far as council is concerned for maintenance, etc of common good in the meantime. Um, included in, in paragraph five in the report is just some um, ideas as to looking into the way forward. Um, Granton has only a few um, assets that might in any way be considered, I think, income generating. And I think that will be one of the difficult aspects in looking at how Granton is managed strategically. Um, and in due course, it, it would merit some um, discussions further on that point as to how best to um, deal with those things. Um, there are a number of assets that perhaps would incur expenses rather than in accrue any income. Um, but overall, I think it, it's useful exercise. Um, the register is there and the register is available to be published as soon as, as and if members are happy with the register in the format. It's not a closed register, so that doesn't mean that something can't be discovered at some point in the future. And in fact, that has happened across the Highland funds already. The even quite established funds in Highland we've um, discovered during title investigations, property that should be reclassified as common good, and that has then been included in the registers. So there may yet be more property out there in Granton that isn't that obvious at the moment. Um, but certainly there was nothing that came back other than the two um, emails from um, members of the community that are detailed at Appendix 2 um, that raised certain um, assets that, in fact, wouldn't be, for the reasons given in the representations, wouldn't be considered common good. Um, and I think at that stage, really, the next step is to have all of this published on the Council website and then to consider what uh, members may wish to do from a management point of view thereafter, which is, is more to do with strategic management on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm not sure if there are any questions around the documents that are before you today, members, but I'm happy to answer any that you may have. Oh, it's just a oh, just a point about um, income generation. You know, if, we, if the council eventually does go to the proposed charging for car parking, then obviously the high street car park would be beneficial not just to the council, but to the common good fund. So there, there possibly as an income stream there. Obviously, it might be a shared asset with the council, but that will be for a future area committee to, dis to consider. But certainly there are potential um, income. Uh, Councillor Coburn. Thank you, Sarah, for the clarity during this whole process and the way you've laid it out for um i've certainly found it really helpful so really appreciate the work and effort and i just wanted to thank you something that i didn't know until you spoke there was that it's not closed so if something else you know there questions something and i think that's important that we get that message out to communities um that if a question is asked, it will be investigated and uh, identified year and So thank you for that, and that's really helpful. Members, there are five recommendations, two for you to note and three for you to agree. Can we agree these, please? Agreed. Thank you. And we move to item 13, and it's you again, Sarah. You're on mute, I'm afraid. 
Sorry about that. Trying to be too efficient there previously. Um, this is very much a shorter report, members. Um, you may recall it. It's part of the process that we've been having to go through um, because the proposed community asset transfer lease of the market stance playing field, with the market stance playing field also being common good, um, it's it's consultation heavy as a process in that regard because obviously there were the appropriate um, procedures that had to be gone through as part of the community asset transfer that members have already considered at the previous area committee meeting and then we moved on to the common good aspects um, which we had to do because the community asset transfer lease proposal then formed the proposal within com the common good process. Um, again we only received two responses to the consultation. The outcome of the consultation is, is detailed in paragraph four. Both, unsurprisingly, both um, responses were fully supportive. Um, the next step would be to ask members in accordance with the recommendation to agree the proposal to dispose by a community asset transfer lease. Because the market stance is classified as an inalienable common good asset, and this is because of the nature of use, that the market stance was specified, the playing field was specified to have, which indicates that in the in actual deed that transferred it over that it's to be maintained for community use in all time coming. It gives it an inalienable quality. We also have to go through the additional hurdle of applying to the Sheriff Court for approval. That's contained in different legislation. Um, we've done a number of these in the past. So far, we've been fortunate that none of them have been opposed. Um, on average, they've gone through in about three, three to four months from start to finish. We have to do a um, statutory advert in a newspaper and we have to give at least 21 clear days notice of that. Um, so that's where things then seem to get a little delayed. Um, and then we're also at the whims of the court listing, depending how busy the court is. Um, the hearings themselves are currently still being conducted by telephone, which was set up during um, the COVID restrictions and seems to actually be working quite well for courts where there are no objections and no defences lodged or answers lodged in proceedings. So I suspect that will be the same again. So once we actually get to the first date, I'm hopeful that that will be the final court outcome for it. And then the matter can then proceed to, to put the, the process in place for the lease to be undertaken. It does seem somewhat long-winded members, but unfortunately it's the situation that we're stuck with. And despite our best endeavours, we couldn't quite work out how we could run the two sets of um, community empowerment consultation requirements side by side because we needed one to form the proposal in the other. Um, it's an unfortunate situation, but I think we're getting there. And the Shinty Club have been very understanding about the length of time that it's been taking. They understand. Um, that they're requirements that we have to comply with. Um, so I would ask members to consider the recommendations and, and move the, the matter forward in accordance with the report. Members, there is widespread community support for this, so can we agree to the proposal um, under item two of the recommendation uh, and note items one and three? Okay, uh, agreed, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, members, bye-bye. Chair Allen's joined us again. He got called into the Black Isle Committee, which is unfortunately we've got the two committees running at the same time. So Allen's now back with us. Thank you. I, I'm dis I'm disappointed that the Black Isle Committee takes precedence, Alan, but um, well, I'll leave you with that. Apologies. Um, a to me on the agenda, members, and I'll hand you over to to Alan Webster. Thanks very much, Chair, and good afternoon, member. Good afternoon, members. Apologies for my my sudden exit there. OK, place based investment programme, uh, as you're aware, the Scottish Government have awarded the Council just under £2 million as the, the first tranche of a five year uh, funding stream. On the 1st of September, e &I Committee uh, agreed an area distribution methodology, uh, as we did with the Town Centre Fund, basically uh, replicating the very same calculation that the Scottish Government used to distribute the uh, funds nationally to all 32 local authorities. That has resulted in your committee being allocated £129,222. You'll remember last year, uh, a war business meeting on the 4th of October, you expressed a desire to invite bids for the available PBIP grant, as you did with the Town Centre Fund. Now, that process opened on the 29th of December and closed on the 19th of January. A total of eight applications were received 
and the total grant amount requested was just short of 300,000. An extract of each of the applications uh, can be viewed in Appendix 1 of the report. I don't propose to comment on sections 3, 4, 5 and 6 of the report members. The background to the programme and the implications have been discussed at the ward uh, business meetings and via email briefings. Therefore, I would like to jump to section 7, uh, which is looking at the applications uh, received. I'm sure that will be of most importance to yourselves as well. As is typical with this type of funding, the proposals received by the Council do vary significantly in terms of uh, project outputs and outcomes. When I flag up some, some issues with the projects, it's, it's by no means a criticism, far from it. They all have their own particular local benefits and impacts. In assessing which projects to support, there's, there's four key considerations, uh, members, for you to consider. Firstly, does the project satisfy one of the seven PBIP objectives detailed in Section 5? Fundamentally, is the expenditure capital in nature, i.e. Is a fixed capital uh, physical asset? Third one is quite a challenge. Can the expenditure be contractually committed by the 31st of March 2022? Now, when E and I considered this on the 1st of September, uh, whilst the five-year funding programme, PBIP, was welcomed, the one-year grant award letters uh, was flagged up as, as an issue and there was a, an agreement to write to the Scottish Government to seek flexibility in that regard. Now, I've had informal discussions with officials late last year uh, regarding that. Uh, they totally understand uh, where the council was coming from. Uh, you know, with the town centre fund, they've been very pragmatic and offered support and flexibility. Now, we don't have that approval in place just now from the Scottish Government. We will be going back formally now that some of these projects are running through the system. Uh, what has come through in other area committees is that members wish to support the projects that deliver the maximum value for Highland communities rather than being dictated to by deadlines. Uh, so there has to be a wee bit of uh, give and take in that regard. Uh, so we will be going back to the Scottish Government, as I say, uh, to formally request flexibility. And fundamentally, the last one, uh, the fourth consideration, does the project, do the projects align with the local community plan and partnership objectives? Now, a key requirement in the decision making process by e &I committee was that members take into account the views of the community partnerships when allocating place-based funding. If you don't mind, Chair, could I just call in Liz Cowie, the Ward Manager, just to, to make a brief comment in respect to that particular uh, element of the paper? Liz. Thanks, Alan. Sorry, you caught me on the back foot there. I was dealing with another issue. If you could just summarise that for me again, I would appreciate that. Thank you. The fourth uh, consideration that members need to take account of, Liz, was the uh, the, the views of the Community Plan and Partnership in terms of these proposals. And obviously, you, you've run this past the, the, the partnership or the chair of the partnership, and it was just to uh, give members an update on, on that work and make sure that none of these proposals run contrary to the aspirations of the partnership. Absolutely. I can confirm that, members, at the last community partnership meeting, we were in a position to provide a briefing and an overview of the Place Based Investment Programme funding, its aims and objectives, and the committee that report that had been put forward by Alan to the, the ENI committee. And there was absolutely full support from the community partnership for the proposals. And in particular, they were pleased to see that um, items were going to be coming forward, like potentially going to be coming forward for members' consideration, such as the Burnfield toilets. And they were very in support of the approach that had been taken. And that was endorsed by that particular community partnership before the chair um, finished in post in that partnership. So that was something that was dealt with. And we were pleased to be able to take that to the community partnership and have that support. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you very much. So we'll just run through very briefly the, the, the applications that have been submitted. If we turn to uh, 7.4, again, can you see Shinty Club? It's a, it's a project we know well, given that you've supported it with town centre fund uh, monies in the past. Uh, the Shinty Club are seeking 50,000 towards phase two of the Market Stance Regeneration Project. Phase two consists of the floodlighting and fencing and is estimated to cost £175,000. Uh, given that you've given the town centre funding uh, support previously, it's no surprise that alignment with the town centre renewal objective of the PBIP is a, is a strong outcome for this particular project. So the objectives are met, it's capital. Deliverable, what I'm saying here is partially, there's, there is an element of risk that phase two may not be implemented in a comprehensive fashion due to the decision timetable of match funders. 
However, the grantee has indicated that it's possible to commit the PBIP side of things. Uh, so there would be no issue there. It would just maybe have to split the, the contract into, into two uh, component parts. Moving to 7.5, uh, the Can You See K6 Memorial Project. Again, Arker seeking the sum of £20,706.40 to provide a permanent memorial for K Royal Indian Army Corps Service Corps. Uh, the total estimate cost is 21,000, so there's an extra 1,000 pounds of match funding coming in there. The location of the proposed memorial is in the Gainac Gardens. Again, the gardens has uh, benefited from TCF investment. Therefore, the project should be viewed as a further phase of, of this development and the improvements align with the town centre renewal objectives of the PBIP. This capital and again, no deliverable uh, deliverability concerns members. There's quotations obtained, a uh, preferred contractor in place. 7.6 Burnfield uh, Public Convenience Project, a straightforward project. The granting initiative are seeking 21,000 towards the 45,000 pound refurbishment of the toilet uh, block, including motorhome waste disposal. Again, fits with the PP projectors, it's capital deliverable. I say yes, match funding in place and quotations obtained. So no issues with that one members. 7.7. .7. The Woodland Wheel Pump Track Floodlights, this is the Boat of Garden Community Company. Again, they're seeking 10,000 towards phase two of the project. Phase two is to install the floodlights itself. Uh, the provision of lighting is important to extend the available hours of, the, in, of use in the winter months, uh, particularly after school activity. And the estimated cost is just over 32,000. Again, this is the, the, the final piece of the jigsaw in terms of this project. The PBIP objectives are met, it's capital and deliverable again, all match funded in place and quotations obtained. So no issues there. Do you like play park? OK, so granting initiative are seeking 15,000 towards the comprehensive refurbishment of Dooley Park, including the installation of new play equipment. The estimated cost of the project is £80,000. Now the PBIP objectives are met, it's capital deliverable. I'm saying yes, but there's a slight risk present as far as the cost estimates are nearly a year old, this may necessitate a revision of the scope of works delivered within available budget, but I think that's manageable. Members, uh, I don't see that being a major showstopper to that project. Moving towards 7.9, Newtonmore Play Park. The group here are seeking 15,000 towards the comprehensive upgrade of the play park, including installation of new play equipment. Now, the estimated cost of the project is 120,000. Project meets the objectives of the program. It is capital. In terms of deliverability, I'm saying no. Only 30,000 of match funding is in place, and the program indicates that designs are still to be subject to community consultation in May 22. I also assume that landowner consent will also be required, so there's a bit of work to be done there. Given that funds need to be committed by the 31st of March, I'm saying this application is premature and should be considered for a future round of the PBIP. Moving to Burnfield Garden, uh, 7.10 of the, re the report. The Granton Society are seeking just over 61,000 towards a 62,000 pound project to re redevelop the garden. 7.10 explains the various components of that redevelopment. It is capital, despite I've said no in, in that report, uh, so that's an error on my part. The PBIP objectives are met. However, there's significant risk present with this particular project. Evidence has been provided by the applicant that there is an appetite to improve the area, but there doesn't appear to be any comprehensive design that has been subject to, to any form of public consultation, and there's no statutory consents in place with that particular project either. And finally, 7.11, Newtonmore Village Hall. Quite a big ask here, just under uh, £100,000 to extend the village hall and provide a community kitchen, disabled toilet and accessible shower and changing facility. PBIP objectives are met with that proposal. It is capital deliverable. I think there's significant risk with this one members. The proposal is based on a 2011 consultation exercise. So, you know, a lot has changed in the last decade, but particularly over the last two years as well. So whether this represents uh, the best value for, for this particular community, uh, I think this project needs uh, further refinement, feasibility work, and there's fundamentally there's no statutory consents in place for this project either. Just to conclude, members, in terms of the PBIP area allocation balance, what I'm saying in 8.1 is 
if you do not commit your entire balance uh, today, any residual funds I'm suggesting are held as a contingency. I think we've done this before with the Town Centre Fund and delegated authority be granted to Malcolm McLeod in consultation with the area chair to allocate any commitment, any uncommitted funds if required. Thank you, Alan. You know, members, these projects are transformational for some of our communities. Um, and I think we've supported the majority of them all the way through. Those that clearly Alan is recommending that we don't progress with uh, are obviously capable of coming forward in one of the next rounds, because I think one of the big things about this source of funding is it seems to be, be recurring over the next um, five years. Well, four years plus this one. So um, these these are fabulous projects, members. Um, any comments? Councillor Coburn. Alan, thank you and for, for your detail and your your availability in, in the short time frame that we had for this. Uh, you've been absolute, your clarity has been exemplar and, and really great. And the one thing that you've, you've also highlighted is the projects that are not going forward. Um, I hope that uh, we we get the support mechanisms in place, whoever or how, whatever form that takes, to encourage these communities and these projects what needs to be done and, and where the journey, where they are now and where they need to go on that journey. But just thank you. And I think it is so important for communities to see what can be done. Um, and, and thank you for that. That's a hard look. Um, I just wanted to add thanks to Alan because I understand he's been doing this not just for us but for a lot of people and the work he's managed is outstanding um, and I just wanted to thank him also for helping some of the projects come forward and I understand that some of them aren't ready but that they are still very good projects and will probably be furthered in the future so it was just to say it's really encouraging to see this funding coming forward it being taken such good advantage of and also really heartening to know that there's further years so people can plan projects that come forward in stages um, and I add my support to, to the ones that are ready and 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 competent okay thank you bye members if you look at the previous paper you'll see that probably the the really um, easiest way forward for communities uh, was to apply for funding under the previous paper and that allows them to work the project through so by the time it gets to a dis definitive construction project we've got something there that, in concrete that, that allows us to look at uh, but you know I, I think Alan there's some huge great amount of work here um, and I think all the communities sh should, should be really thankful for the amount of work you've put into this so members there are two recommendations one of which is basically to consider and agree the projects that are before you. Um, and the second one is to agree what we do with the balance of the money under recommendation two. So can we agree that, please? Agreed. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, we probably won't see you again in similar situations, as I'm led to believe that um, you're, you're elsewhere. That's indeed right, but not moving very far, uh, Chair. Uh, so. Just to thank members for, for the positive comments there. Uh, as always with, with these uh, application processes, we, we don't walk away once the, once, once the bids are in. Uh, we do try and provide uh, ongoing support and feedback in terms of developing those projects. There, there's a lot of uh, funding out there, uh, so we do try and uh, signpost. And uh, thanks to the board manager as well and colleagues who have helped in the in, in process and moving these forward and the relationship continues in that regard. But just in terms of the recommendations, Chair, can I just be absolutely clear which projects are receiving funding? Uh, because obviously the way I've structured it there, we, we taper off at the end where there's concerns. But I think just for, for the absolute avoidance of doubt and clarity, it'd be good just to, to pinpoint exactly the ones receiving funds, if that's okay. It is the funding for all the projects, excluding, I believe, um, the ones that you said were not particularly deliverable, which is, uh, hold on, I'm having a wee bit trouble with the button. It's the new Moore Village Hall project, the um, Burntfield Gardens project, and is it also the Newmore Play Park, new, new Moore Play Park project? Yeah. Which is not to say that they, they, we won't look at them in the future, but that they're not approved at this particular time. Absolutely. Thanks for that clarity. That's great. Appreciate that. Thank you, members. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye.
Members, item 14 in the agenda is the confirmation of minutes. Um, they're just for noting. They were already approved by the council, so they're just there for noting. And, and one final item for me, members. Um, it's been a long five years, and during these five years of this area committee, we've been helped by a multitude of staff. Uh, and you'll have seen Alan Webster, many other members of staff, and also people from outside bodies, fire service, the police, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the, uh, the, the clerks who have, have helped, I suppose, clerk our committees all the way through. It's currently Lorraine but, Lorraine, but it's also been a number of other people in the past. But I think most especially we need to thank our ward manager, Liz Cowie, and, and especially when this, this is possibly our last ever meeting together, members, in a formal setting. So um, thank you very much all and um, enjoy the rest of your day.